Hello, I'm Tom Mudd from DigiLed and you join me in a secret location in the Surrey Hills of the UK. There's a thread going on LinkedIn right now from a gentleman called Matt Ward who is compiling a history of LED screens and video walls and the form factors that the walls took um, he's put a shout out to the industry because we're all not working in the same way we were two months ago and he's asked for information um, historical information about how LED screens were assembled how panels were assembled how giant screen structures were put together um, so here I have a little historical gem to share with you um, come and have a look at this so this beastie that we have here this is an InVision DCM15 LED screen and this is one of the world's first ever LED screens and there's a few features that I'd like to show you around a few things that are common with today's technology and a few things that were absolutely groundbreaking and unique to this product so this is before we had sub one millimeter LED tiles. This is before we had these creations. Remember these? Uh, this is of course from before the days when we had surfaces like glue on board that were scratch proof and waterproof and supposedly gonna save our industry. Um, the DCM15 panel from InVision used a um, encapsulated pixel technology. Um, each one of these polycarbonate lenses you see here has an LED hidden behind it. Now you may notice that there's a um, ridging to the lenses. The reason for this is that the invention of this LED panel actually predates the time when LED manufacturers knew how to get the wide angle light throw of a pixel to be perfect. Nichia had launched their blue LED just a year before this panel was made. And indeed, um, uh, Nakamura, the uh, Nobel Prize winning inventor of the blue LED, he came to visit Envision Microsystems a number of times in the late 90s and um, certainly liaised with Jeff Lunn and Arthur who were the directors of InVision and the inventors of this panel. Um, this is called a DCM 15 panel because allegedly it's 15 mil. It's not, it, that was one of the marketing tricks. It's actually a 30 millimeter panel um, with um, this one, two, three, four, five cluster representing one pixel, and then one, two, three, four, five being the very next pixel. Um, the reason it was called DCM15 though, it was because even back in 97, 98, um, InVision had pioneered a virtual pixel technology. Now, I know a lot of people poo poo virtual pixels, but they actually got it to work. And the reason it works is that the human eye is much more sensitive to brightness than it is to color. So if you can display brightness information on single LEDs and color information on whole pixels, you can actually do a very good job of simulating a screen that has double the resolution you think it should have. The cluster you're looking at here has these shaders removed just for clarity uh, these were stick on polycarbonate beasties and i'm sure many of us of a certain age who've been working in leds for a long time will remember the amazing injuries and scratches you can get from the corners of shaders like this um, the cluster itself um, is a let me get this right one, two, three, four by two pixel cluster. So it's um, slightly larger than a playing card. And you can see 
the foam gasket there that is used to waterproof the cluster as the cluster is screwed down to the aluminium case of the panel. Um, anyone care to guess at the resolution of this panel? It's uh, very kindly written around the back here. 32 by 16, 32 pixels in an entire panel. This was cutting edge back in the 90s. Um, looking around the back, you'll see that the, um, the form factor of a aluminium box continues. Um, the uh, covers, louvers here, are uh, for managing airflow. I believe it was air intake at the bottom and air outlet at the top. Um, I'll show you inside shortly, but there's an array of fans sat all the way across the top here that manage the airflow through the cabinet. Um, for data, these days, uh, we live in a world of Cat5 cables and twisted pair data distribution. Back in 1997, InVision decided to use fiber optic. Very, very cutting edge. And this little door here. Oh, look, there's some tests. There we go. 21st of the 8th, 98. Test 15. 27th of the 8th, 98. Test 4. That gives you some idea about the, the age of it. Um, these little clips here, these are fibre optic clips and InVision chose to use a plastic fibre optic because it was very robust, uh, very cheap and so easy to work with that if you had a bust fibre you could actually re-terminate it in the field with nothing more than a Stanley knife blade and a pair of pliers. It was great stuff. The mounting points of the panel, these are, I guess they're M8 bolts. Um, four of these in the corners. These were notorious back in the day for leaking. Um, all the other seals on the cabinet, the foam rubber seals here, the foam rubber seal between the, the box and the back plate, these were all fine. Those are, but when these mounting holes were drilled into the panel, um, a slight design omission was that no gasket was placed here and water used to creep in here and yeah let's just say the inside of these panels weren't particularly dry power connectors these are chunky old possibly harting connectors i think they are just looking for a marking um but this was an early example of the the loop through power that you find on many modern screens. The um, connector here, good chunky industrial connector. Um, live neutral earth on three connections and three spare connections. The spares were intended um, for some permanent installation projects to carry ancillary power such as heater power or maybe fan power so that a switched off screen could be maintained at a decent ambient temperature even when it wasn't in use. Um, those pins are replicated over here and this would be the the loop through power to the, the subsequent panel. Good chunky connectors, good and waterproof. Um, but behind the connectors there's another um, little InVision trick that is missing from today's panels and could actually be very, very useful. I'm not sure why it's not done these days, although I suspect it's related to cost. So let's have a look inside and see what we can find. I mentioned one of the shortfalls of this panel that everyone knew about at the time was the fact that water leaked around here. One of the other shortfalls everyone used to love was the fact that the hinges snapped off the doors. <laughs> the hinges were never quite strong enough to look after the doors in the field. So here we have the uh, classic snapped off hinge scenario. I mentioned just now the um, clever little bit of um, power engineering that is located behind the AC sockets. If you have a look down here this device that says Crydon. This is a solid state relay. So it's a, an AC power switching 
relay with no moving parts. And if you look at the loop through, um, the um, brown cables here show that the power from the input runs through this relay to the output. Now, what turns this relay on? The thing that actually activates that relay is the power supply starting up. And we all know that power supplies don't instantly switch on. They take uh, a second or two to fire up. So this is actually a very clever way of avoiding inrush surges. If you had a, for example, 50 panel screen connected up, you could actually switch the power on with just regular breakers, just chunk, chunk, chunk. And those breakers would not trip because panel number one would have to start up before panel number two got switched on. And panel number two would then activate panel three, panel three to panel four, panel four to panel five. So it was a rippled startup to the AC power, which avoided any horrible inrushes. Other great little design features for this product that are somewhat absent from today's. Um, there was, of course, a concern about this being true CE and having um, a genuinely um, good radio emission characteristic because these were intended to be used on stages with radio mics. And remember, this is the 90s, so we were in an analogue world. Radio mics were analogue, signals were analogue, um, audio cables running everywhere were analogue. Um, it was very important to have good RF behaviour. And you'll see that one of the ways this was handled is with this um, RF braiding that's included here on the gasket all the way around. Now, when the door closes, this, RA, uh, this RF braiding touches up against this bit of aluminium here. And I hope the video is picking it up, but you can see here that there is no paint on this part of the aluminium. So, in a nutshell, the door um, becomes electrically connected to the bare metal of the main chassis and the entire device then becomes a Faraday cage and any nasty radio emissions inside the panel are trapped and kept inside in exactly the way that you'd expect a Faraday cage to work. Other little engineering tidbits for EMC you'll see big chunky ferrites clipped around ribbon cables. Long chains of ribbon cables like this to this very day are terrible for uh, radio emissions. They, they basically act like a transmission aerial and they just squirt out RF. So clamping these ferrites on is a good way to prevent that leaking. Of course, I mentioned the fiber optics earlier, the plastic fiber optics you see here that's what they look like. That's got a, a one millimeter core and just clips in there. This was also a very good way to avoid RF troubles because of course you cannot get um, electromagnetic radio frequency emissions from a fiber optic cable. Unless of course you count light as part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Yes, I, I give you that. Moving swiftly on, power supply. This is um, that well-known brand, a Kestrel from Advance Power. Let's have a look. It's got um, 50 amps of 5 volts, 12 amps of 12 volts, a secondary 12 that can do 6 amps, um, another 5 volt that can do 20 amps, and a final 5 volt that can do 5 amps. This is um, a split rail power supply, so lots of voltages available. Uh, the 12 volts was used for operating the circuitry of the um, what we'd now call the receiving card. Um, the 12 volts also operated the solid state relay. So until the 12 volts became active, subsequent panels would not power up. You'll see fairly chunky looms of DC cable floating around in here. This is the five volt system that distributes power to the LED drivers and then the LEDs themselves. And this comes from a, let me spin it round, a DC distribution board here. Um, 
again this this board was quite pioneering this this is like generation one of that board here but subsequent generations went on to have um, runtime meters and remote controlled switching on them so that you could have your power supplies running and keeping warm but you didn't have to send any power to your LEDs when say for example your stadium was unoccupied or the gig wasn't happening. Very, very forward thinking, very early stuff from InVision. Another little nugget that we used to be very familiar with back in the day but we don't see anymore. Little dip switches on the driver boards. You had to get your dip switches in the right position, otherwise that section of screen would not show the right bit of the image. Um, I'm sure any techs who are familiar with the old lighthouse gear will have many happy memories of dip switches being in the wrong position and strange things happening on the screen. Um, I'm going to put this phone down now and pop out a couple of boards and then I'll show you the back of the clusters and the sort of tasks you'd have to do if you were servicing one of these. Okay, I've just popped out one of the driver boards, um, interestingly enough. Copyright 1997 InVision Microsystems Limited RGBG LED driver cluster. Revision 5. So there's a few interesting things there. 1997. Um, the blue LED only really became commercially available in 1996. So you can imagine the planning that must have been going into um, the imminent arrival of blue LEDs for screens back in 95, 96, 97. Uh, one of the reasons that InVision had a head start in this field was that InVision were actually making video screens before the blue LED became available. There's some material in Matt Ward's um, historical documentation that show InVision marketing material from around 96 that shows video images on screens that only had red and green. They're the most fantastic sepia looking things out there but yep InVision were building video screens before the blue LED was available. Um, let's have a quick look at the back of the circuit here. So these are the driver chips. Um, these from memory were Toshiba driver chips. It says TB752 G 270 BF. Anyone from OptiScreen? Do you remember the, the BF CF fun we used to have? Um, something that isn't immediately obvious from this uh, that was absolutely cutting edge back in the 90s. This is 16 bit drive. Um, this had 16 bit levels of brightness capability that the pixels could be driven at and I know uh, for an absolute fact that the lights of Sacco and Lighthouse and Kotko, all of those guys, uh, they were only running on 8-bit until at least after the millennium. Interesting side story, some of the um, InVision team after InVision shut down went off to Philips and then there was a liaison between Philips and Lighthouse and there was a surprising amount of this technology that started to become apparent in both Philips products and Lighthouse products at the time. Let's see inside the panel. So you're looking here at the back of the clusters. Um, this is a two layer PCB and it's interesting, it's got holes in it so you can actually see through the cluster to the polycarbonate lens in front. There's a date stamp there that says 26th of the 8th, 98. And a second one that says 11th of the 8th, 98. I'm guessing one was the PCB fabrication date and the other was the assembly of the cluster. Um, I'm going to put the phone down again now and 
pop out a cluster via these two screws and let's have a look at the wee beastie. So I've removed the two screws that secure the cluster. I've um, cheated slightly because they were some of the easiest screws to access to. Believe me, if you're trying to get to the screws on this one or this one, you are gonna lose the skin off your knuckles. Um, so the cluster pops out from the front here. And here is the little unit. Like I said, this is a uh, four by two pixel, real pixel pitch but there was virtual pixel technology in there. Um, do you remember the driver board from the back? Um, it specified that it was an RGBG board. That's right, two Gs, two greens. Um, so two greens were used in the pixels of this, um, specifically to try and get the brightness needed for outdoor use. Now at the time, Jumbotron with its CRT technology was just about hitting 4,000 nits of brightness. And I think the Sony boys knew that this was a bit of a problem uh, for outdoor display screens. Hence they relied heavily on shaders to try and give them the contrast ratio. Um, brand new InVision DCM15 um, would easily hit 5,000 nits. Um, at the time, it really was the only technology that could produce a daylight visible um, video image. Oh, look, more stickers, more stickers. So, if you can see that, InVision Limited DCM15 made in the UK, batch code 98EL01. So, yeah, this is a um, definitely a, a 98, 1998 vintage LED screen. By the way, the, um, the very first DCM15s were actually manufactured in 1997 and the um, glorious Aston Villa were the recipients of the two first permanent install RGB full colour DCM15 video screens. I don't think they're still there now. So, one other little nugget of invention from InVision. Let me just come around here. Somebody had the genius idea that maybe if you were a technician working on the back of the screen, wouldn't it be really useful if the size of that hole there was big enough for your replacement part to fit through? And this was unique to Envision. They were the first people to do it. At the time, there were LED clusters being made by, I believe, Kotko or Cree. Um, but they were a square form factor. They were a cube. And they could not fit through the hole that was left in the chassis when a um, cluster was removed. Those had to be lowered down the front of the screen to somebody waiting on the ground who would then tie on a replacement one on a piece of string or a piece of fishing line and the technician at the back would have to haul it up, pull it in and that was the only way you could replace those clusters from a rear accessed screen. Let's have a quick look at what we would now call the receiving card on the InVision panel. Um, it's this square card here that outputs two buses of data. Uh, there are Philips chips there. Um, 74HCT 244N, I'm guessing those are buffer chips. And of course the biggest components on the board are these FPGAs. You can see the quite chunky devices there. They would of course have a custom FPGA program on them. Now, these little chips here, these were called taxi chips. And it was these chips that actually led to the demise of um, the panel, the InVision system as a viable um, video screen. And also, interestingly enough, the Gearhouse Opti screen. Can you guess who built the electronics for Gearhouse? OptiScreen, and I'll give you a clue. 
they might have been from Ipswich. But the taxi chips, yes, the taxi chips here. These little square plug-in chips, uh, they were the chips that enabled the data to be transmitted over the fiber optics. Uh, they were the gateway to the use of the plastic fiber optic. And the manufacturer of the taxi chips packed up in around about millennium 2001 and the availability of taxi chips stopped. So all of this technology, all of this processing technology that was based on a plastic fiber optic transmission system, um, suddenly there could no longer be any more manufactured. It was the end of the road for this technology. So, as I mentioned at the start, Blue LED became commercially available in 1996. This product uses circuits that were envisaged and designed and constructed in 1997. Um, this particular panel, which um, incidentally used to live at Elland Road at Leeds United, um, this particular panel manufactured in 1998. Shall we see if it still works? Shall we plug it in, see what happens? I hear fans running. Yep, yeah, we've got a running fan. We've got a green LED on the power supply. And on the front, we got pixels. Well, I guess you wouldn't expect a video image. As I said, the taxi chips are defunct, so there is now no way to input a video signal to this product. But, um, let me just try rebooting this one more time, see if I can get it to um, strobe. Strobing, by the way, amazing unintentional feature of the Envision receiving cards. Um, used to light up the night sky when you did a gig. So here we are. This is a, I guess, 22 year old LED screen and it is a bright sunny day here at this secret location in Surrey Hillside and you can still see the pixels lit. This is a piece of LED history that really ought to sit in pride of place somewhere in a museum of LED. So uh, here you can see all the uh, red LEDs illuminated. Um, interesting tech point, although you see pairs of LEDs lit up here, they were actually driven as single LEDs connected in series. So a shortfall of this was you had the old um, Christmas tree fairy lights problem where if one LED popped out, then they would both pop out. But this was done for um, voltage management and compatibility with the Toshiba driver ICs that were available in the late 90s. I think I've got some pixels out of my screen. Yeah. It's not, a, not bad for 22 years old though. Um, you can see the diamond pattern of the green pixel arrangement here. Um, this diamond pattern combined with the human eyes um, sensitivity to greeny yellow colors was one of the things that helped enable the virtual pixel technologies because this would give you the appearance of a brightness pixel map with a 15 mil spacing even though your video pixels were spaced on a 30 mil. 
and it finally I managed to get all the pixels static on a test pattern. See, a single pixel being a green top left and a green bottom right, a blue top right and a twin red bottom left. If I get in close you can see how the lens pattern on the clusters helps to um, spread the light out to the side. Um, as I said at the start, this was necessary because at the time LED manufacturers, I think these are Nachir LEDs, LED manufacturers were not making LED packages that had the cosine distribution of light output that was needed for an LED screen. A cosine distribution, by the way, invented by a gentleman called Jeff Lunn, one of the founders of Envision. Um, the idea passed to Nakamura and Nichia that Nichia said, thank you very much. That's exactly what we needed. And ever since that day, every video screen LED in the world has had a cosine light output. Thanks to Jeff Lund.